So, Sae's Palace is a little on the longer side of dungeons in this game, but it's also one of the coolest. What's cool about it is the fact that you actually have to interact with the characters in the dungeon in ways other than just killing them. And once again, it's one of those dungeons that takes multiple visits to beat. First, you have to get a whole bunch of coins, which can only be done by raiding the machines, and after that, you can't go any further until you get closer to Sae which we do by attending one of her court cases. After that, we have to go through a dark maze, then survive a series of painfully easy battles with only Joker, for which I'm still using Garamakala, and it gets us the required amount. Sai then bumps the required amount to 1 million coins, but through using the ability to borrow coins, Akechi managed to get over 900,000 on his own card, which allows us to continue moving forward. So I secure the route to the treasure room, get the last will seed, and get out. I can't send the calling card until November 18th, so I just spend the next month working on social links and stats. I'm also finally able to complete the next challenge battle. The thing about these challenge battles is that it's really just about having the right coverage and making good use of the baton pass. The more times you pass the baton, the stronger your attacks get, and the more damage you do, the more points you get, and you have to use the multipliers to make sure you get even more points. This one has a 6x multiplier for whenever Ryuji takes down an enemy, so I pretty much just knock down the enemies with whatever they're weak to, pass the baton to Ryuji, and have him finish them off. You're mine. I also get a catchy social link as high as I can, and when I do, he challenges Joker to a 1v1. Thus, I've built up this urge to duel you without holding anything back. Let's go! As long as I have Giramakala equipped, he can't do much. At least that's what I thought until he actually does manage to beat me on my first attempt because Giramakala is weak to light, which is what he specializes in. But after that, I just make sure to keep my stats up and then he can't touch me, even with all that. By the end of this whole period, I have all my stats maxed out except for Guts. Maruki then announces that he's leaving the school, invites us to lunch, talks about his plans now that he knows we're the Phantom Thieves, and this maxes out our social link with him. The next day, Makoto delivers the calling card, and now, it is time to steal Sae's heart. Now, Sae is surprisingly one of the most normal bosses in this game, after you get past the first phase, that is. There's not much point in trying to deal damage for this phase, since your attacks are hardly going to do anything. During her turn, Sae will use Roulette Time, where you can't attack, with anything, not even status debuffs. Otherwise, she'll bring you down to 1 HP. After the next turn, you'll have to bet on where the ball will land. Obviously, the game is rigged, and there's a glass pane above the ones you don't bet on, so the solution is to send somebody to shoot the glass so that the ball can drop in the right place. I send Yusuke, and that's exactly what he does, and after this, Sai stops with the roulette time, and we can now have a normal battle. Well, aside from the fact that there's still a roulette wheel, but you can't bet on it. It just determines which attacks Sai will use and what her resistances will be. It's in a similar vein to Isamu from Nocturne, where if she gets fire, she'll resist everything except for ice, for example, or electricity if she gets wind. But it's not as punishing here because it's only resisted and not reflected. And once she gets below half HP, the wheel will automatically land on Almighty and all her affinities become neutral, so by that point it doesn't even matter. But like I said, even with the elements she resists, it's better to just attack her resistance for less damage rather than wait for her to use something you have better coverage for. Either way, she shouldn't be able to do much to you as long as you keep your stats up and her stats lowered. For this battle, I bring along Makoto, Yusuke, and Akechi, and they pretty much just spam whatever their best attacks are, while occasionally healing with Makoto and buffing with Yusuke. Joker pretty much keeps Giramakala on the entire battle, and besides that, there's really not a whole lot to say. This whole battle is just one really long endurance round. From the start to the end, this whole battle lasts about 15 minutes, and it's pretty much just an exchange of attacks until one side runs out of HP. Aside from whatever magic she gets from the wheel, she'll mostly alternate between a variety of physical attacks like Severing Slash, Gatling Gun, 100 Slaps, and Brutal Impact. These attacks, again, aren't strong by themselves, but they can become a problem when she crits with them. 
But again, because this is Persona 5 Royal, you're probably always going to have some kind of easy way out, be that through Futaba randomly helping you out or you getting a Showtime attack. Toward the end, I do slip up and Sai is able to take out Makoto, but because of this, I get a Showtime attack, which does just enough to take her out. Let's end them! You're gonna regret that! Won't they, Fox? On guard! After we beat Sae and take her heart, we're not done. For whatever reason, the palace isn't collapsing, so we have to split up in order to escape. Here we just pretty much play through the main tutorial all over again, and now we're finally caught up to the present. This completes a social link with Sae, and we figure out who the real culprit is. But after that, well, I think you all know what happens. Hmm. Have you finally pieced it all together? Truth is, the game was rigged from the start. Thankfully, with the information we gave Sae and through some weird loophole in the metaverse system, we are able to fake Joker's death. I'm not gonna pretend it makes the most sense, but the point is the game isn't over. Everything Akechi did was part of a plot to eliminate the competition so that David Cross could become Prime Minister of Japan. The same David Cross that got Joker to where he is now, and we decide to make him our next target. We find his palace, and this first part is pretty much just scouting it out and coming up with a plan. But, new palace also means new area in mementos, so I decide to get that out of the way first. Other than that, I spend a little bit of time working on the usual stuff. Some stats here, some social links there, and a lot of working out to boost my HP. I try to finish whatever party member social links I have left, but unfortunately your party members won't be available as often if you haven't completed the palace yet. So, on December 5th, I decide to go to Shido's palace, and this is one of the longest and most complicated palaces in the game. For one thing, the design of the dungeon can make it extremely confusing at times, and much like Sae's palace, here you actually have to interact with the NPCs in order to progress. You need to get five recommendation letters from Shido's supporters in order to be allowed into where he is, and these have you going to different parts of the boat for each one, like the restaurant, the private rooms, and the pool. I like how for the pool section you need to find swimsuits to get one of the guy's attention, even though you have the swimsuit costumes provided to you by the game, but when you put them on, nobody seems to react at all. Bruh. And also, even though you have to trick them into giving you the letters, someone always messes something up, so you have to fight them as many bosses although none of these bosses are anything to write home about. I'm still using Gear Mikala, and because of how the AI in this game works, the enemies are attacking themselves half the time. Although, once I'm able to recruit Kali about three quarters of the way into the dungeon, I start using her. Mainly because she comes with Brave Blade, which is not only strong, but also has a really high critical rate. And even though she doesn't reflect physical attacks, she does reflect gun. And I can make her null physical thanks to that null fizz skill card I got from that arcade side quest I did in Mementos earlier. Eventually, I do get all the letters, but before I can see Shido, we're interrupted by Akechi. First, I have to fight him in his first form, which is with his white outfit, and he also summons two shadows to fight for him, those being Cuckoo Lane and Cerberus, both of which are extremely easy. Not only do they barely have any HP for bosses, but at the start of the battle, they use a move that raises their attack, but lowers their defense. Their attacks aren't even that strong, and with the help of Yusuke, Ann, and Makoto, they go down in just a few turns. After that, we have to fight Akechi himself, and it's not really much different. He can use light and dark attacks, but thankfully nobody in my party is weak to either of these. He also knows Megidolon, which does absolutely nothing, and after he uses that, I get the charge from Futaba and easily finish him off. After that, he gets even crazier, changes clothes, and now we have to fight him again. And if you thought this form would be any more difficult, you would be right, but not by much. At the beginning, I noticed that Ann and Makoto are critically low on SP, so I swap Ann out with Ryuji and then have Makoto use the soul food on herself, because she's a little more important. 
Aside from the beginning, this fight pretty much goes the same as the last one did. The only difference is that Akechi now hits slightly harder and has a wider array of moves. His physical attacks still aren't doing enough to kill, and he also has that attack increasing, defense decreasing move that the two shadows did, which only makes the fight go faster. He also has Moragi on, which nearly knocks out Yusuke near the end, but it doesn't, and then I'm quickly able to finish him off with a Showtime attack. After that, well, some enemies show up, but Akechi stays behind to stop them, at the cost of his life. But, now that we have all the letters, we have access to Shido's chamber, which means we can send the calling card. I take the next day to wash some armor pieces, and thankfully this time I don't have to wait till the last day to send the calling card. So I send it, get this dramatic cutscene that totally doesn't give a hint at who Joker's friends are, but whatever the case, I go into Shido's palace and challenge him. Now, the first phase of this fight is against Shido in his Statue of Liberty form, where he stands on golden animals or objects or whatever. The first one is a lion, and he reflects physical attacks, which is a huge problem because it means Joker pretty much can't do anything with his best persona. So for this part, I switch back to Gira Mikala. He also likes to use the Kaja at every chance he gets, so if you want to use buffs, you're better off debuffing him rather than buffing the party. Shido has a wide range of physical attacks and buffs, as well as Wage War, which enrages everyone. This is especially bad because it means everyone will always use their normal attack, which means they'll pretty much just be damaging themselves since he reflects physical attacks. The first time he uses it, it hits everyone except for Yusuke, who I have heal Makoto, who automatically heals Ryuji, and then uses her energy shower to heal Joker. After this, it's pretty much just spamming magic attacks. Once you get him down to about two-thirds of his HP, he'll change into his wing form, and from here things start to get a lot easier because he loses his reflection to physical moves. He does have access to pretty much all elemental magic, but it's only single-target heavy attacks. My first Brave Blade with Kali does over 1400 damage, and he immediately changes into his next form before he even gets a chance to attack. The Pyramid form has no resistances at all, and he only has two Almighty attacks, one of which only hits one party member at a time, and the other takes two turns to use. And, right after he changes into this form, Haru and Makoto get a Showtime attack which does over 1700 damage, and then Ryuji finishes him off with a Megaton Raid which does over 800. Though, of course, that's not the end of the battle. For his next phase, he fights us just himself. Once again, he has no resistances, and his attacks aren't actually that strong. The only one that's kind of a problem is his Heat Riser, which raises all of his stats, and he likes to go for this a lot. The only counter I have are the sprays and the baptismal waters, but these are a limited resource. Not to mention, you're not recovered beforehand, so if you wasted all your SP on the first form, well, you better hope you have some SP restoratives. That being said, it's still not that hard. I pretty much just handle it like any other boss fight, spamming my best attacks while keeping his stats lower. Once you get his HP really low, he'll change forms again, and now he's Super Shido. And this is the only part of the fight where things are mildly difficult, mainly because he has access to every multi-target magic attack in the game, plus Hama'an and Mudun, and a whole bunch of ailment skills plus buffs, charge, and all single target severe magic skills. He also has a move called Tyrant's Wave, which takes two turns to charge up, but does a metric ton of damage, so make sure you guard when he's about to use it. I have a couple of close calls where Joker's HP gets pretty low, but it's not enough to finish him off. To my surprise though, I never really feel the need to change my party members at all during this fight. Makoto, Ryuji, and Yusuke are all doing decent damage and have buff skills to cover all stats for the party. Once he gets down to about a quarter of his HP, he'll challenge Joker to a 1v1. This sounds easy given Joker's physical resistance, but the problem is I don't have a lot of healing items left, and I don't have any reliable healing personas either. I tried digging through my inventory hoping in vain that I'll have some beads or some obscure healing items that can help me, but I don't, and Shido manages to finish me off with a Thunder Rain. So, I think it's time to rethink my strategy. Unfortunately, because of this challenge, I can't really fuse anything that will give Joker healing abilities and reliable defenses at the same time. So, what I have to do is give Kali Regenerate 3 in hopes that this will mitigate my HP problem, 
as well as charge, because why not? But the biggest change I make is equipping Joker with the Salvation Crown. This is an item from Tanaka's Shady Commodities, which costs almost a million yen, but it is more than worth it, considering how early in the game you can get it, because it allows you to use Salvation, which heals everyone's HP and cures all ailments. So I attempt the fight again, and it's pretty much the same as before, only this time I do a better job at conserving my resources, and Kali's Regenerate 3 proves to be a big help. I also swap Yusuke with Anne midway into the fight, just so I have an extra healer. Once I get to the 1v1 part, I make sure to make good use of charge so that I'm not only dealing more damage, but also conserving HP, since in this game that's what I use to pay for physical skills. I'm automatically healing about 30 HP each turn, and Salvation proves to be a big help since I can just restore my HP when it gets low. My first Brave Blade does almost a thousand damage, and after that it's only two more hits before Shido goes down. After that, we steal the treasure, but Shido in the material world uses a drug to temporarily kill himself to make his palace collapse early. Everyone just barely escapes thanks to the help of Ryuji, where everyone thinks he dies, but he actually survives. So we all go get dinner to celebrate. Yeah, that's all that happens. No, nothing else. They all happily went to go get dinner, and then they went home. So that's the end of Shido's palace, but I still have to wait for the change of heart to take place. So once again, it's back to the usual stuff. I do go back to Mementos to finish some side quests, but while there, I also decide to challenge the Reaper, since I've pretty much made it a tradition to fight him in these Persona videos, even if it's not mandatory. Thankfully, it's a lot easier to summon the Reaper in Persona 5 than it is in 4. You have to just be on a floor for at least two minutes, which is exactly what I do. He'll then show up, and then the fight can begin. Now, if you fought the Reaper in Persona 3 or 4, it's pretty much the same deal here. He has a crap ton of HP, crazy high defenses, and has almost every powerful physical and magic attack in the game, along with all the break skills. Surprisingly, unlike in Persona 3, he doesn't actually resist anything, but because of how high his stats are, my attacks are still hardly doing anything. Meanwhile, his attacks do a lot, so it's pretty much mandatory to keep your defense up and or his attack down. Another thing is that his AI is actually smart. He can and will target your party members' weaknesses. On the plus side, though, this also means that I'll be getting a lot of Showtime attacks, and this is really the only way to deal decent damage to him. My attacks are normally doing under 50 damage, while Joker's charged attacks are doing 100 to 200 damage, while Showtime attacks will deal well over 500 in most cases. The team I start out with is Joker, Yusuke, Makoto, and Ryuji, but I do swap Yusuke with Anne about a quarter of the way in, mainly so that I can make use of her Matarunda. The Reaper does pretty much what I expect him to. He just spams magic attacks and whatever break skill he feels like whenever he gets the chance. In this battle, using the break skill is actually the best thing he can do because, well, if he's breaking my resistances, he's not attacking. He also really seems to not like Anne because he goes for Bufudine on her an unhealthy amount of times. And despite her having a second tier persona with Evade Ice, it doesn't really seem to help much, so I have to revive Anne a lot during this fight. Other than that, there's really not a lot to say. This whole fight is pretty much just a repeating cycle of attacking with everyone while buffing with Ryuji, Makoto, and Anne, and healing with Makoto when necessary. Makoto does get low on SP a couple of times, but thankfully I have a good amount of SP restoratives. And while I do have a few close calls here and there, the fight mostly goes smoothly. That is until the very end, where he's almost fully depleted of health, so much so that you can barely see his health bar, and then this happens. What? Are you... Are you kidding me? What? Oh my god, dude. Bruh. I don't even... Oh my god. Oh my god, dude. Why? I don't... I... Oh my... Ugh. So the game is over. Yeah, the game. Oh my god. Yep, despite the fact that Joker resists darkness, I still got hit with Mamu Dune, and because it's game over if Joker dies, I failed the whole fight and have to start all the way over. 
Well, I attempt the fight again, and it pretty much goes the same as before. However, this time I have a counter for his insta-kill attacks, that being Tetraja, which blocks a single one for all party members. Unfortunately, I don't get as lucky as I did last time, and I have to play more defensively because he seems to go for insta-kill moves a lot more. This fight takes well over 20 minutes, but I am able to finish him off with a well-timed Showtime attack. And my reward for beating him is not only the Divine Pillar, which gives its holder firm stance, but I also gain 5 levels, which leads me to believe that I was severely underleveled for him, but either way, the Reaper has been defeated. After that, there's not a lot to do other than wait for Shido's change of heart, which does happen, but this doesn't seem to change anyone's opinion of him, and they still want him to become the Prime Minister. This gives Morgana the idea of going to the depths of the Mementos so that we can change the heart of the masses, since Mementos is basically everyone's collective palace, but doing this will also make it impossible to enter the Metaverse. Everyone agrees anyway, so we head toward the bottom of the Mementos, and there are some very powerful shadows crawling around here, including Abaddon. Now, Abaddon is the only persona in the game that naturally absorbs physical attacks, and he learns Enduring Soul. For this reason, he's probably going to replace Kali and be the last persona I use. Recruiting him is a bit difficult since he has no weakness, but eventually I am able to knock him down and recruit him. And after teaching him some necessary moves, I quickly make my way down to the bottom of the Mementos, where we have to fight the Holy Grail. It's another one of those fights you're not supposed to win, which we can't because the masses keep feeding it with negativity and healing it. Everyone then starts disintegrating, Joker wakes up in the Velvet Room, the twins come together to form Lavenza, and Igor reveals himself to actually be Yaldabaoth. Turns out he helped us because he hoped that the Phantom Thieves could change humanity's desires, but that didn't happen, so he plans to revert humanity to, as he puts it, rampant distorted masses. But this means they won't be able to think for themselves, so I turn him down, and now I gotta stop him. Before fighting him, there is another mini-dungeon you have to do, and there are some very strong demons here like Mott and Mara. And along the way, I also have to fight the Archangels as some easy mini-bosses, but they're nothing to write home about. At the end of the dungeon, I have to fight the Holy Grail again, this time for real. He'll immediately go for Will of the People, which heals him, even though he's already at full HP, so you need to send one party member to cut the veins that are supplying him with HP. Now, for this fight, I bring along Yusuke, Haru, and Makoto, and I send Yusuke to cut the veins, which takes a couple of turns. Until then, you just have to keep hitting him with whatever you got until this happens. His attacks are pretty powerful, but he only gets one action each turn, so I recommend keeping your defense up just to be safe. Once Yusuke cuts the ropes, he'll start gathering light, which, if you've learned anything from the other bosses in this game, means he's going to use a really strong attack next turn, so make sure you guard. Fortunately, he doesn't have a lot of HP, and for a giant metal cup, his defenses are actually pretty low. My attacks are doing a lot of damage, and it's only a few minutes before the Holy Grail is defeated. Take this. But of course, that's not the end of it. Once you're done, he'll transform into Yaldabaoth, and now we gotta fight him for real. Now. Yaldabaoth is nothing like the Holy Grail. The first turn, you can only attack the main body, but after that, he'll start using his other arms to pull out different kinds of equipment. These arms are treated like their own separate combatants, and they can also use their own moves, and they actually do have a decent amount of HP. 1500 to be exact, which isn't a huge amount, but it is enough to set you back a couple of turns, and I do recommend taking these arms out as soon as you can. The first one he pulls out is the Gun of Execution, which can either deal damage or inflict an ally with hunger or lust. I'm able to easily take it out and then spend the next few turns attacking the main body until he does this again. The main body can't actually do much by itself. Aside from its three turn charge attack, its only attack is weak, and the other moves it has are Dekacha and Dekunda. It does have a pretty high 15,000 HP though, but its defenses are pretty low. Now, the other equipment it can pull out are the Bell of Declaration, which can inflict you with either weakness or jealousy and debuff your defenses, the Sword of Conviction, which can give you either gluttony or attack everyone, and the Book of Commandments, which inflicts you with either wrath or pride, and has all heavy single-target magic attacks. These all sound pretty bad, and they are, but like I said, they're relatively easy to take out. Once you take them all out, he'll start reviving them, but when he does this, they only have half the HP they started with, so taking them out is even easier. It's pretty much just a repeating cycle of taking out the arms, attacking him, then buffing and healing when I need to. 
I start out the fight by using the same party I used for the Holy Grail, but early on, I do swap Makoto with Anne. Once he starts to get really low on HP, he'll go for his three-turn attack, which can easily be dealt with by just guarding, which I don't do, but everyone is able to hang on since they haven't run out of HP yet. And I get a Showtime attack, which I honestly wasn't expecting to happen during this fight. He'll also bring out all of his arms at once, but at this point, it's better to just focus on the main body rather than worry about these things, and after that, it's not long before he goes down. Did we do it? No, not yet! But of course, we're still not done, because now we gotta watch this long cutscene and then finish him off in a short scripted battle. We get some support from everyone down below, and then Joker gets Satanel, his ultimate persona, and we finish off the boss with Sinful Shell. Joker, we're entrusting our strength and the people's hopes to you. Put an end to this! Pillage him! Satanayo! So we take the Holy Grail, and then the Metaphors starts to disappear, along with Morgana. But it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Sae tells us that I need to turn myself in so that I can testify against Shido. That is, until Akechi shows up and offers to do it for me. I then spend the afternoon with Hifumi, Morgana comes back, this time as a realistic cat, and we do the obligatory celebration later. And then, that night we have a dream where we're walking around what looks like the school. Once I wake up, things seem kind of off. Why is Futaba talking about her mom? Why is Haru talking about her dad and Yusuke talking about his sensei? Why is Morgana a human and why do I actually kind of like him right now? Well, Akechi stops by and explains that we're in some sort of distorted reality and we're the only ones aware of it. Kasumi calls us and we decide to go check out that palace that we saw earlier in the game. So we go check it out and find out that Dr. Maruki is the one behind the palace and the alternate reality. We also find out that Kasumi is actually Sumire, the younger sister of the real Kasumi, and she's been pretending to be her sister out of guilt because she inadvertently led to her death. We fight an easy mini-boss, and then the next few days is spent snapping everyone out of this reality. And unfortunately, that includes Morgana, meaning he's back to being a cat and being annoying again. After that, we have to go back to the palace to rescue Sumire, but she's against this, so we have to fight her as a boss with just Joker, and it pretty much goes the same way as the fight against Akechi did, only now it's even easier. Abaddon resists light and completely absorbs physical. Sumire just keeps spamming Sword Dance, which I absorb, and after about a few Brave Blades, she goes down. But that's not the end of it. Once she's defeated, her persona goes berserk, and Maruki also pitches in by summoning two Byakis to assist in battle. If you take them out, he'll immediately summon more, so there's not really much point. That is, until you realize that they can be used to heal her persona. But by that point, it should be apparent that you're not actually supposed to win this fight, because after a few turns, everyone else comes to help. 
Now it's much easier because we can easily take out the other enemies and deal decent damage with four party members. With them, it's just another easy mini-boss. Through the use of Baton Pass, I am able to deal astronomical amounts of damage and take her out in just a few turns. Once we get home, we all agree to make Maruki our next and final target. We go back to the palace, Sumire joins the party, and now we can go through it like any other palace. Seeing as how this is the only palace that is in the post game, it is much longer than any of the ones we did before. It's not confusing though, and we're pretty much just working our way through, fighting whatever enemies and mini bosses come at us, that is, until we get to the control room. We can't go any further because there are cables blocking the way, and the only way to get rid of them is to go to Maruki's control room in the mementos. So we leave, and for this next period, whichever party member's social links you've completed, they can awaken to their third tier personas if you talk to them, which is something I do before going back and completing the mementos and the palace. I also finally complete the first fight against Makoto from Persona 3 and you from Persona 4. Now, you're probably wondering why I put these fights off for so long, and the main reason is that I don't want to just beat them, I want to be able to finish them with the high score, but with my limited arsenal of personas and items, that's not as plausible as it should be. For the Makoto fight in particular, I get a bonus for attacking with light skills and attacking with Morgana, but without the Velvet Room, I never have access to any of the accessories that teach you light skills, so I can't do both at once. Not to mention, with there only being one enemy, it means I can't stack the Baton Pass any more than once because if I hit the enemy's weakness when it's already down, I don't get another turn. Considering that I get more points for doing more damage, that makes things a lot harder. The best thing I can do is bring along Sumi Ray and Morgana and have Sumi spam light attacks while Morgana does whatever he can. Makoto will be constantly switching personas throughout the battle, but you can easily tell their affinities by just analyzing them. And that's not just because I'm overleveled, even when I was attempting this fight earlier, he still wasn't doing that much. It does take several attempts, but eventually I am able to deal enough damage to finish him off in the required amount of turns and earn enough points to collect all my rewards. For the fight against you, though, it is a completely different story. For Makoto, the required amount of points to get everything was 60,000. The required amount for you is 1.2 million. Keep in mind that the game wants you to attempt this at level 50. Here, you're rewarded for using physical attacks, scoring technical hits, and having Haru attack. So, how are you supposed to go about this? Well, when Ryuji awakens to his third tier persona, he learns the skill Fighting Spirit, which basically applies charge to everyone. Now, as for getting technical attacks, unlike most bosses, you can actually be put to sleep, which is what I bring Anne along for. Her lullaby doesn't have the best chance to hit, but if you want those extra technical attack points, you're going to need to put him to sleep. And as for Haru, well, I don't have any physical skills on her, and her gun skills don't count, so what I do is I give her the Heat Wave belt. It's not the best physical skill, but without the Velvet Room, it's the best I got. The strategy seems pretty good on paper, but the problem is that I just can't do it in a good amount of turns. You get a 300,000 point bonus for beating him in under 20 turns, which itself isn't hard, but doing that and getting enough points isn't. This is mainly because the only way to get a good amount of points is by hitting him with a charged technical physical attack with Haru. But this takes at least two actions to set up. If you're lucky, most of the time it's around four to six. I was getting ready to give up, but that's when it hit me. I don't actually need to get the 300,000 point bonus at the end to win. I mean, yeah, it helps, but as long as I have enough points by the end, the amount of turns doesn't matter. And with the ability to put him to sleep, I can make him heal himself if need be. So what I do is, I keep the same strategy, but when his HP gets low, I let him sleep it off. And then attack him again. I keep repeating this until I get to 1.2 million points, and then finish him off. It's tedious, and it does take well over half an hour, but eventually I am able to do it and collect my rewards. Rewards that I won't be using because they're DLC and that's banned. 
Now, you might be wondering when in the video I'm going to be doing their level 99 fights, and I'm actually not going to be doing that in this video. Those fights are meant to have you exploit every broken mechanic in the game, and also have all the DLC personas, and this isn't ideal for a challenge run. I actually did attempt them a couple times while I wasn't recording, but I didn't even come close to finishing them. I don't want to say it's impossible, but it is going to take a very long time, and I don't want to have to put off this video any longer. What I'll probably do is upload them as a separate video on my second channel later. But anyway, after that, I go back to the mementos, get to the new area, and get rid of the cables. But before I leave, there is one more optional boss I want to do, and that's the fight against Jose. In order to do this, you have to get at least 123 stamps from the mementos, then go to the control room, and here, you can fight him. And by the time I do, everyone is maxed at level 99. Now, being an optional super boss, you'd think Jose is actually going to be difficult, but that's not really the case. In fact, I'd actually say he's much easier than the Reaper. He has attacks that deal heavy elemental damage for all the elements, plus a physical attack. But beyond that, there's really nothing special about him. His only resistance is to physical, and he only gets one action per turn. I start off the fight with Haru, Yusuke, and Sumire, but I swap out Yusuke for Akechi early on so that I can keep all his stats down with Debilitate. I pretty much spend the majority of the fight trying to knock him down with a crit with the help of Sumire's Brave Step, which I don't think there's any point to because I don't land a single crit in the entire battle, leading me to think he's immune, but even with the resistance, I'm still dealing decent damage. Although the biggest damage dealer is Haru, since she had one-shot kill, which he doesn't resist. Toward the end of the fight, he'll start going for Special Fireworks, a two-turn almighty attack that can easily kill the party, so make sure you guard when he does. I forget to do this the first time, and he takes out both Sumire and Haru, but then Futaba activates her ultimate support, which revives them and heals the whole party, further reinforcing my point about how easy this game is. Other than that, there's not really a whole lot to say, it's just attack, 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 and attack some more. At the very end, he goes for special fireworks again, and instead of guarding, I decide to take a risk and just try to finish him off since he's critically low on HP. A pretty big risk, but it turns out to work, and I am able to finish the fight. A few days later, I go back to the palace, and this time the puzzles are a bit different. One of them has you answer a series of questions which, if you get right, you get an item, but if you get them wrong, you have to fight an enemy. And then this insanely tedious color mixing puzzle that we have to do just before the end of the dungeon. Plus, as we go through the palace, we find rooms with TVs and videotapes that contain information about Dr. Maruki's past and how he got to where he is today. Anyway, eventually I do make it to the end, and after that there's nothing else to do here. And just like with Sai's palace, we have to wait until the last day, so we do still have some time left. The next day I max Sumire's social link, and then... There's really not a lot I can do. I mean, I do have some social links that I suppose I could try to finish, but I seriously doubt I'll actually be able to finish them. I just find some ways to kill time, get Sumire to her third tier persona, and on February 2nd, I send the calling card, right after which Akechi awakens to his third tier persona. The next day, we head into the palace to challenge Maruki, and at the top of the staircase, we challenge him and his persona, Azathoth. I regret not pointing. It's time. Our final battle has come. My persona guides me. Now, this fight is actually kind of similar to the fight against Yaldabaoth. There's a total of five combatants Azathoth, Maruki, and three tentacles the tentacle of healing, the tentacle of protection, and the tentacle of assistance. Now, seeing as how Maruki himself is a combatant, you may think that the primary goal is to take him out, but this actually isn't the case at all. Your attacks are hardly going to do anything to him, and even if you somehow are able to get him pretty low, you'll get healed by the healing tentacle. You're instead going to want to concentrate your fire on the main body of Azathoth, that weird skeleton-looking thing. The more tentacles there are, the less damage he'll take, so you actually want to go about this in a very similar way to how you do the challenge battles, 
where the best strategy is to exploit the tentacle's weaknesses and pass the baton as much as you can, and then attack the main body for massive damage. I bring along Makoto, Yusuke, and Sumire for this fight. Makoto and Yusuke because they both get the multi-target all-stat debuff and buff skills respectively with their third-tier personas, and Sumire who has light magic skills and masquerade, one of the best physical attacks in the game, although Joker is still going to be my primary damage dealer because his Abaddon knows Deadly Fury. I start by setting up my buffs and then have my party members attack the tentacles with whatever multi-target magic attacks they have so that I can learn their weaknesses and resistances. And when you know these, it's not that hard to take them out and pass the baton. And with the party I have, I always have attacks to cover all of the enemy's weaknesses. Every turn, Maruki will revive all tentacles, and when this happens, they do sometimes change weaknesses, but like I said, with the party I have, I'll always have coverage in some form. And his attacks really are nothing to write home about. For one thing, the tentacles can't even do anything on turns when you take them out, and Azathoth has almost no coverage with pathetically weak attacks. The first successful Deadly Fury I land after a triple baton pass deals almost 3,000 damage to the main body, and it immediately brings him to the second phase. Now, his second phase isn't actually that much different. The tentacles still work the same as before, and the main body has a few more attacks, but nothing that'll set you back too much. Not even his two-turn attack is that strong. The only move that's kind of a problem is his evil smile, but this doesn't have the best chance to hit, and I have more than enough ways to heal when it does. The other gimmick added to this phase is that sometimes Maruki will ban the use of certain things, like buffs, magic, physical moves, etc. And there's nothing you can do other than wait for these effects to wear off the next turn. It's especially annoying when he bans Baton Pass because that's how you deal damage to the main body. It doesn't make the fight feel impossible, it just means it takes a little longer. But other than that, it goes the same as it did before. When I'm able to land a successful Deadly Fury, it still does around 3,000 damage. And when Joker can't attack, Sumire is still doing decent damage with her Masquerade attack. Joker's final Deadly Fury does just over 3,000 and finishes him off. And after that, all there is to do is take out Maruki. This whole fight lasts a little over 15 minutes, but for a final boss, not too bad. And that's pretty much the end of it. I say pretty much because the fight technically isn't over, but the rest of it is extremely easy. Maruki's persona mutates into Adam Kadmon, and for the next phase, all you gotta do is hit him as hard as you can. Adam Kadmon will use Revitalize Soul, which deals not a lot of damage, and then he'll use Grand Palm, which does enough to kill most allies, but by the time he uses this, you should already be almost done. And a few hits later, Maruki goes down again. Let's go. Then we go into his next and final phase, and there's really not a lot to do here other than defend. Adam Kadmon will take almost no damage at all, and he'll go for full force, a two-turn almighty attack. You pretty much need to have everyone defend, which I forgot to do with Joker, but he takes it like an absolute boss thanks to the divine pillar I gave him. And after surviving a second hit, you get a cutscene where Joker hits him at his weak point. So, Adam Kadmon goes down. Morgana saves everyone by turning into a helicopter, but Maruki still isn't giving up. At this point, we don't even have our personas anymore, so we have to beat Maruki in a fist fight. I gave up everything! Everything! So why? Cool! 
Welcome, Punch! Once we beat him, that undoes everything he set up, meaning we're back to the original reality. Akechi is dead, Joker is in jail, but with everyone's help, he gets out. I then go through this long post-game cutscene, and on the day Joker leaves, he's apparently being followed, but we're helped by an old friend. Come and get us! <laughs> Shall we then? <laughs> if you find yourself struggling in life, you can start over, like me. Remember that. So yeah, if that ends up saving you, then we're square. <laughs> Good luck. taught me to keep my head up, didn't you? <laughs> Told you I was coming with you! <laughs> Joker gets on the train, and then the credits roll. So, is it possible to beat Persona 5 Royal without the Velvet Room? Well, yes, but actually no. I did still have to do that mandatory fusion in the tutorial at the very beginning of the game, but as long as you make an exception for that, it is possible. Though, I was still a bit disappointed with this challenge. I mean, Persona 5 is an extremely easy game, and very rarely in this playthrough did I actually feel like I was being challenged. I'm hoping that with the PC release coming soon that there will be mods that actually make this game difficult, but we can only hope. I don't think Persona 5 is a 10 out of 10 best game of the century, but it is still a good game, and I'm glad I got to finally do a challenge video on it. As always, guys, be sure to check out my links in the description. If you want to financially support me, consider leaving a Ko-Fi donation. And be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe. Till the next video, I will see you all later.